Okay, I greet all of you in the wonderful name of Jesus once again. And you know, uh, uh, today uh, I want to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We are going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. Now, we are talking about moving forward in this season. We are talking about continuing this journey despite our circumstances. We are talking about moving as a church in oneness. We are talking about the church of the kingdom. Now, you must understand the church of the kingdom is not a weak church. The church of the kingdom is not a poor church. The church of the kingdom is not a, a church that is sick. But the church of the kingdom of God is a strong church. And, and the Bible shows us 1 Thessalonians is a model church. Thessalonia, the Thessalonian church is a model church. It's a church of the kingdom. And a church of the kingdom uh, 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 is a church that is strong. Now, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. But the word of God says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and of our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now, I think we have come to a season, not I think, I know we have come to a season where we need to understand our position. Last week I told you that we need to repattern, realign and repattern our lives, our families, our ministries into the pattern of God, the pattern of the kingdom. And, and in order to, 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 to apply the patterns of the kingdom in our lives, the pattern of the kingdom must be a lifestyle. So we got to see what the first church did. Because the first church obviously followed the patterns of the kingdom of God. So these first four verses, I want to call it the introduction to the, to the Thessalonian church or to the Thessalonians. The first four verses clearly gives us a picture of a strong church. The picture that is painted in these verses is a model for all churches, for all generations. It is the picture of a strong church in carrying on a work for the Lord. Let's look at verse 1 again, because there are, there are a few important things that I want you to note this morning. Verse 1 says, Paul, Silvanus, Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The first point I want you to note is this. A strong church has ministers who are faithful to the church. A strong church has ministers 
who are faithful to the church. Note, I want you to take note that Paul was not writing this letter alone. Silas and Timothy joined him in exhorting the church. And you must, you, you must ask yourself why this letter is so special, why this exhortation from the three ministers instead of just Paul himself? Why all three are writing that letter together? The reason is very simple, because these particular ministers had been the three who had founded and ministered to the, to the church throughout the early years of its ministry. All three of them ministered to the church. And of course, Paul, you must understand, Paul had been the head minister, the head pastor, if you want to call it, or the senior pastor. But the other two had worked just as faithfully for the Lord in their call to be associates. I want you to note this. The point I'm trying to make this morning is this, the first point. What makes a strong church? You must understand the Thessalonica church was strong because the ministers of the church had remained faithful to the church. They remained faithful from every indication that they had, the, the, uh, we see that everything that the scripture indicates here, that these ministers remain faithful to the church. They had continued to stay in touch with the church. They continued to exhort the church. They exhorted the believers through visits, through letters, as long as they were living, as long as they were able to minister. Right now, to back my point up, scripture, other books in the Bible confirms this. We see that Paul visited the church in Thessalonica when he returned to the area on his third missionary journey. We find this in Acts chapter 20, verse 1 to 2. We also know Timothy made a special visit to the church for the very purpose of helping the church through a difficult time and to establish and comfort the believers in their faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 to 6 speaks about that. And we also know that all three ministers wrote the church at least twice. This letter, 1 Thessalonians, and the second letter to the, Thessalon uh, to the Thessalonians. At least twice they wrote to, to this church, all three of them. Now, I want you to think about this. How many churches lack strength because their ministers have not remained faithful in exhorting them? The ministers have failed to remain faithful to exhort the people to follow on with the Lord. The ministers who have not remained faithful in exhorting the people to follow and support their present ministers. Paul, probably the greatest minister, I want you to also note this, the greatest minister, the most influential minister who has ever lived, acknowledged Silas and Timothy as equal to him. He put their names together with his. Now, this doesn't mean that we take away the honor that Paul requires. He was an apostle and a servant of the Lord. Right? In today's terms, you call it senior minister, senior pastor, bishops. But we give honor and respect to our leaders. That is a kingdom pattern. But at the same time, we don't make our leaders our God. And leaders shouldn't pressure or put their associates, their pastors, their leadership team, their people, they shouldn't put them in a position where they are not equal. Remember, in the kingdom of God, we are equal. But rank and position has to be honored and respected. And Paul showed this. 
Paul never took the glory for himself when he wrote this letter. He included Silas and Timothy because Silas and Timothy were equally involved in establishing and running the church. Right? In Acts chapter 14, let me give you a scripture reference again. In Acts chapter 14, verse 21 to 22, here's what scripture says. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Working together for the benefit of the gospel, for the expansion of the gospel. The second point is this, on a strong church. A strong church is a church of the people. Paul did not address, I want you to take note of this, this is very important. Paul did not address the letter to the church at Thessalonica, but to the church of the Thessalonians. Now, I want you to understand this. That means Paul did not address the letter to Shekinah Grace Church. He did not address the letter to full gospel assembly. But he addressed the letter to the church at Malaysia. I hope you are following me, right? He addressed a letter to the church of the Malaysians. The church, you must understand, the church was, is, and will be the people. The people who had accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Without people who are committed, without people who are committed to the Lord, there is no church. Remember, the letter was not addressed to a particular group of leaders. It was not addressed to a bishop. It was not addressed to an apostle. It was addressed to the people of the church. Every believer was important. And it took every one of them to make up the church. I want to tell you this this morning. Each one of you is important. Because each one of you makes up the church. A strong church is a church of the people. A church that is comprised of all the people. A church that is built upon all the people. A strong church is a church that acknowledges the importance of all the people. A strong church is a church that involves and uses gifts of all the people. A strong church is a church that recognizes and esteems the presence and contribution of all the people. Now, I want you to also note, I've just given you all the facts of making a strong church when it comes to people. But there's also several things that will weaken a church. What weakens a church? Building the church upon a few leaders. I mean, building the church upon a, 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 a few people or leaders. Ignoring and neglecting the needs of some members will weaken the church. Failing to involve the use of the gifts of some of the members will weaken the church. You know, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3 to 5, Paul says this, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many 
are one body in Christ and every one members one of, one of another. People are important, my friends. I'm still, on, I'm still expounding on verse one. The third point is this about a strong church. A strong church is founded in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul says, grace and peace unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You take away any one of these, you take away God, you take away Jesus, there's not a church anymore. Now, when you look at the words, in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, that means Jesus Christ is said to be equal with God the Father. Let me rephrase that. God is acknowledged as the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ again. They are equal, but God is acknowledged as the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the distinctive belief upon which the church is built. And I want to tell you this morning, this is the distinctive belief upon which this church is built. We believe that God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I want all of you, wherever you are, just lift up your right hands and declare this with me. Lift up your right hands and declare this with me. We believe that God the Father sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to save us from perishing and for giving us eternal life. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord sent from heaven, that he is God, the eternal Son, and bought it in human flesh and sent to earth by God the Father. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is Jesus the carpenter from Nazareth. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Christ, is the Messiah, is the Savior who had been promised from the very beginning of history. In Jesus' name, amen. That's a declaration. That's our, that is our statement of faith. That is what we stand upon. And as I, as I said earlier, it is upon this confession that the church is built. This confession is the one distinctive mark of the church. Now, a church that is not founded upon God the Father a church that is not founded upon the Lord Jesus Christ is not a church. It's not a true church. I like to call it a club. Right? No matter what you may, it may call it itself, it is not a church. If you take away God the Father or if you take away the Lord Jesus Christ, then that gathering is nothing more than a man-created fellowship. That gathering becomes a man-created gathering. That gathering becomes a man-created assembly. That gathering becomes a man-created body. That gathering becomes a man-created meeting. That gathering becomes a man-created worship. You know, in Matthew chapter 16, let me give you a scripture reference. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 to 18. The word of God says, He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, 
that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus will build the church, the Christ. So if you take away God the Father, if you take away Jesus, it's no more a church. It's a club. The fourth point. I'm still in verse one. The fourth point. A strong church possesses God's supreme gifts. There are two gifts mentioned there. Grace and peace. A strong church will possess the supreme gifts of grace and peace. Now, grace, in the Greek, grace, the word is charis. It means the undeserved favor and blessings of God. Now, I want you to remember this. No church can be strong without the favor of God. No church can be strong without the blessings of God. When we see a strong church, the hand of God is immediately noticed. The hand of God that favors the church, the hand of God that blesses the church. So what is it that brings the hand of God's grace to a church? I want you to note the exact wording in this verse. Paul says, grace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That means grace comes from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. God pours his grace out upon the church that commits itself to the confession that God is our Father and that Jesus is the Lord Jesus Christ. The church that really commits it, itself to this confession is the church that God favors, is the church that God blesses. It's the church that experiences the outpouring of God's grace. Every strong church is a church that is confessing God to be the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every church that is strong is a church that is confessing the Lord Jesus Christ to be the only begotten son of God. Now when this confession is forcefully made and it's demonstrated by a church, then it is, the, it is that the grace, that means the favor and the blessings of God the Father and the favor and blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ pours forth. You know, my spiritual mother once mentioned that sons, sons, express their fathers. Sons do not need to impress their fathers. I want to remind us today, as we journey along, the church today, we have to, to, to express God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not need to impress God, but we express him. The second gift Supreme gift given by God is peace. Irene. That's the, that's the Greek word. It means to be bound. To be joined. To be woven together. It means to be assured. It means to be confident and secure in the love and care of God. It means to, 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 to sense and to know that God will guide us, that God will empower us, that God will deliver, will sustain, he will provide, he will bless, he will encourage, he will strengthen us. But again, note that peace comes only from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In order to have peace of God, in order to have peace of Christ, a church has to have a strong confession. We have to have a strong confession in God as the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to have a strong confession in Jesus as the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father and Christ alone can bring peace to the hearts of men. And that peace can be given only to those who come to God for peace. 
the father and christ cannot give peace to a person who does not come to god for peace the point i'm trying to make is this a strong church is a body of people who know and experience the peace of god as they walk throughout the world day by day in john 14 verse 27 the word of god jesus says peace i leave with you my peace i give unto you not as the world giveth give i unto you let not your hearts be troubled neither let it be afraid let's go on 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 2 right i'm going into verse 2 now we give thanks to god always for you all making mention of you in our prayers we give thanks to god always for you all making mention of you in our prayers a strong church the second point is this a strong church stirs prayer a strong church stirs prayer now this is a crucial trade why do i say crucial trade because god has ordained prayer to be the medium through which he blesses it's a medium through which god moves in behalf of the people you know in matthew 21 22 matthew chapter 21 22 jesus says this and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer believing you shall receive now as i said earlier god has chosen prayer to be the medium through which he acts for men because sharing and talking together are the way all persons communicate is the way we fellowship is the way we commune together and this is true both with men and god prayer requires let me let me highlight this prayer requires our presence it requires our sharing it requires our talking and god wants to fellowship with us he wants to commune with us so all those who are with us i know those who come every friday for our prayer meeting all those who belong to the church here in shekinah grace remember this it is just not calling your pastor and asking him to pray for you your presence is required your sharing is required your talking is required because god wants to fellowship with you and he wants to commune with you if you can't give god time how do you think that he's going to give you why do you think that he's going to give you time please consider this please think about it because few persons heed this fact few persons take prayer seriously but the fact remains a strong church encourages people to pray it steers people to pray for the church for the ministries for themselves note that paul gave thanks to god always for the thessalonian church not only pray for themselves but pray for the people in the church pray for one another because that's what paul did <clears throat> the bible uses the term always paul gave thanks to god always for the thessalonian church let me go on 1 thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3 remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our lord jesus christ in the sight of god our father the next point is this a strong church is a church that is stirred up and aroused to work it's a church that's stirred up and aroused to work now i want you to understand this there are three things that stir and arouse the church to work number one faith faith steers the church to work when a person believes in jesus christ when a person truly believes he is steered to work he is stirred up to serve the lord jesus and the same 
is true with the body of believers, the church. The stronger the belief of the people in Christ, the stronger they will work for the Lord. A strong faith stirs, it, 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 it arouses, it activates, it energizes believers to work and carry out the mission of Christ. You know, in Ephesians 6 verse 16, Paul again mentions this. He says, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The second thing that arouses the church to work is love. Love stirs the church to labor. In the Greek, the word labor means to toil. It means to labor to the point of exhaustion. When a person truly loves Christ, he is prompted and driven to labor arduously for Christ. I want you to note this. That means the believer who is driven by love is the believer who has really seen the love of Christ. He is always conscious that Christ has taken his sins upon himself and borne the punishment for them. That means we know that Christ did all this for us. Christ took our position. Christ took our, 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 our sin. Christ took the punishment for our sins. We know that he is ever, we, we are ever so short of the glory of God that we deserve to be punished as the transgressors of God's law. But we know and we walk around with a deep sense that Christ bore our punishment for us. It is the wonderful love of Christ that stirs the believer to love Christ ever so much. Therefore, we do all we can to please Christ. We do all we can to fulfill the joy of Christ. We do, uh, uh, we do all that we have to accomplish what Christ wants to accomplish through us. This is what Paul meant when he said, the love of Christ constrains me to serve him. Let me give you that scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 15, where, where Paul says, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We give all that we have for Christ. And the third thing that I was talking about is hope. Hope in the Lord Jesus Christ steers the church to endure in its work and labor. You and I won't be here today if we had no hope. We are not a people who have got no hope, but we are a people who have hope. Right? Now, the word endure means steadfastness. It means to persevere. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ because we know that Jesus or the Christ will guide us. The Christ will strengthen us. He will provide us for us. He will sustain us. He will deliver us. He will bless us. And in addition to this, we also know that the Lord is going to transfer us into heaven at the end of this life. He is going to reward us according to our labor here on earth. Therefore, strong believers, strong churches are driven to endure in hope. We are driven to continue on in this labor for Christ. In this hard work, labor for Christ. Now, generally, there are several reasons why a man works. I'm talking about now our jobs, why we work. Firstly, the, the, the first reason for work is forced labor. That means a man is forced to work. Then we have got a second category where there's a sense of duty. That means a man feels obligated to work. Thirdly, you have 
the need to meet necessities. That means a man has needs that have to be met, so he works. Then is the wish to gain more. That means a man works to build up his wealth. So when a, but when a man accepts Christ, his motive for working changes. He now serves and works for Christ. You don't have to be a minister to work and serve Christ. Wherever God has placed you, you your work is to serve and work for Christ. Your faith is in the new world Christ is creating. It steers us to work for Christ. Why do I work for Christ? Because of the faith. I have the faith and the hope that Christ is creating a new world. Our love for Christ and for others steers us to work in order to share the gospel with the world. Our hope in the return of Christ to set up his kingdom causes us to labor patiently. I said labor patiently. And my final point is verse 4 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 4. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. A strong church is seen to be elected by God. We are not elected by men. We are elected by God. The word election means that the church has been selected. The church has been chosen by God. And I want to remind you this morning that you have been selected by God. You are chosen by God. And this means two things. Number one, we as believers of Jesus Christ, we are elected and chosen by God to be his beloved people. That means God has called us out of the, of, of the world, away from the old life, which the world offered, the old life of sin and death. God has called us to be separated. He has called us to be set apart to himself. And the new life he offers, a new life of righteousness, a new life of eternity. Secondly, believers, you and I, we are elected and chosen to be beloved brothers. We are called to hold one another ever so closely to our hearts and to count one another as precious and deeply loved. Remember John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35. John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35, where uh, Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I've loved you. And he also loved one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one to another. In Romans 12, verse 10, Paul again says, be kindly affectionate to one to another with brotherly love. I want us, if, if all this time that what I, whatever I've been speaking, if you can't remember, please remember these two important lessons. To establish a strong church, a strong people, two important lessons. Number one, the proof that a church is truly elected by God is that the members act like the beloved people of God. The members treat each other as beloved brothers. And secondly, a people can show that election also by false profession. Right? First, you have got the genuine ones, and we also must look out for the false, those who are falsely profess to be a church. They act like they are not the beloved of God. They live in sin. They live in shame. They live in dirt and pollution. They live in worldliness and greed. That's not the church. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says this. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation 
which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I pray this morning that as we continue this journey, this journey which is filled with uncertainties, that you and I will love one another as we love our Father in heaven, that we will endure all things for the sake of the elect, we will endure all things for the sake of the growth of the church so that the gospel can be shared to the ends of the earth so that more and more people will be saved and come into the fold of the kingdom of God. I pray that you and I will walk forth as a strong church this week. A strong church. The church of the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Just give me a minute. I pray that uh, the season that we are in, that we as believers, the beloved of the Lord, will never let anything take away that love that God has placed in our lives. To serve God, to serve Jesus, the King, the Redeemer, the one who came to give you and me life to the abundance. This is the season where our faith shows. This is the season where all the years that we have believed and spoken that and you know proudly uh, you know uh, declared that we are children of God. You know what? This is the season of our lives that prove the testings of our faith, whether we are truly children of God, whether our spoken word, what we declared, is still the same, whether we can stand upon what we had spoken all the years when everything has been good in our lives. Now is the time to let our light shine. Now is the time to bring that light to the light to the life of others who are still sitting in darkness. This is the time that we learn to reach out to others, those who do not know the Lord, who does not have that kingdom life. This is the time, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we go all out to be a blessing. We go all out to bring that word in season, that their lives will be changed, and we bring in the harvest of souls into the kingdom of God, our God. To our friends on Facebook, we thank you for joining us. We pray God's richest blessings to be upon you. And we'll see you next week. To our household here on Zoom, just hold on for a while. Recording in progress. Of course not.